You know, I had some good questions during the break. One of them, um, it was a long question, but anyway, they were asking about, you know, but we still have our own spirit and our own personality. And I hadn't got time to go into this. I'll just say it, and you'll have to study this out on your own. But I don't believe that your spirit has what you're calling your personality. That's not your spirit. That's your soulish realm. Your spirit's personality is identical to Jesus. Amen. It's as loving, kind, pure as Jesus is. That is your spirit personality. What you call your personality, your personality traits, you know, to where you're just a, you're just a sad person. That's the way you've been your whole life. That's not your spirit. That's your soulish realm. And your soul needs to change. I've used this example, I think, the last time I talked, but you're three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit's perfect. It's got the same personality, same power, same everything as Jesus. If you get your mind renewed so that you say, I am not going to be this sad person anymore. I'm not going to be a timid person anymore. I'm not going to be a shy person anymore. I'm not going to be a critical person anymore. I'm not going to be negative anymore. I'm going to be like Jesus. You get your mind renewed and start seeing yourself as Christ. That's two against one, and it'll reflect itself in your physical body. And we need to get to where we change our soul so that it's in agreement with our spirit. And that's two against one, and you will begin to start being joyful and happy in things. Many of you don't like the way your, your personality is, and yet you feel trapped. That's because you're carnal. You think that that's all that there is to you. If you could understand that in the spirit, you're brand new and your spirit's personality is identical to Jesus, then you just start renewing your mind and saying, this is who I am. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. And you do this and over a period of time, it'll change your personality and it'll change your actions and it'll change your experience. You do not have to be limited to the way you are in the natural. You are a new person in Christ and as quickly as you can renew your mind, you can become that new person. You know, you're really in a great place because you've come, you've left family, you've done a lot of things. You're here at Bible school, you're hearing the word. It'd be a great time for many of you just to say that that old person is dead. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not this person anymore. These people don't know me. They don't know my baggage. They don't know who I've been. I'm going to come out here and just start being like Jesus. And just, just start acting like Jesus. And at first, some of you will feel like, I'm a hypocrite. That's because your, your identity has been ramped up in your flesh. But if you'll change your identity to who you are in Christ, you could just start walking in love. You could go around and be nice and kind to people instead of mean and bitter. Isn't that awesome? Some people think, but that's not me. That is the new you. Some people think, you don't know me. I know you better than you know you. I know you based on what the Word says. You are awesome in your spirit. You're identical to Jesus. How would Jesus act? That's exactly the way your spirit man wants to act, and he's limited by the way you think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That heart's not talking about your spirit. It's talking about your soul. Remember I taught last time, uh, not, not last hour, but the previous time, that your heart is the combination of soul and spirit together? You have to believe with all of your heart. Your spirit's always believing. Your spirit's perfect, but your mind's not always right. You got to get your mind renewed and the way you think in your mind about yourself is the way your life is going to go. Your spirit is perfect, but it will not exercise dominance and control over you without the agreement of your mind. You got to get your mind renewed. That's the reason Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can become totally a different person by the renewing of your mind. Amen. All right. So last hour I was sharing about how that you're created in righteousness and true holiness. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. You have the mind of Christ. He that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You're sanctified, perfected forever. And people think, well, all right, when I got born again, I became this new creature and all of this happened, but I've sinned since then. And I'm going to try and do something during this hour that is, if I had a week 
it would not be time enough to counter all the religious tradition and doctrine. Uh, and I'm going to try and do it in just the next few minutes. And so this is, again, I'm just, the things that I'm sharing with you, I've spent tens of thousands of hours meditating on, and you're getting one hour's worth of teaching on this. So, man, you need to meditate on this. You need to take these things and go deeper with it than what I'm going to share. But when you got born again, that spirit was created righteous and truly holy. It was perfect. It was pure. And then Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Let me read this to you. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, "...in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise." So the moment you were born again, you became a new creature. That Spirit is righteous, holy, and pure, as perfect as Jesus. It knows all things. It has the faith of Christ. All of these things, it's perfect. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. And then the moment you believed, boom, you were vacuum packed by the Holy Spirit, sealed. Your spirit is encased by the Holy Spirit. And the word sealed here, you know, there's different kinds of seals. Like you can put a good housekeeping seal on something and that means they've inspected it and they stand behind it and guarantee it. But then there's also a seal, like when you make uh, preserves. When a woman makes preserves, she puts it in a glass uh, container and then puts paraffin over the top, which makes an airtight seal, and it keeps any airborne impurities from getting in there and making the thing rot. And so that's the type of seal this is talking about. Your Holy the Spirit, the born-again Spirit that was created identical to Jesus, is sealed by the Holy Spirit and no impurities can penetrate that seal. So when you sin as a Christian, that sin enters into your physical body and it'll enter into your soul and your emotions. And it can bring physical sickness. It could, like for instance, if you go rob a bank, it could put that body in the jail and things like this. It can bring depression to you. It can bring discouragement. It can bring confusion. It can harden your heart towards the Lord. And it can affect the soul and the body part of you. But the spirit part of you never fluctuates. It's sealed. And you retain that righteousness and that holiness that you had the instant you were born again. You retain that regardless of your actions. Now that will get you kicked out of nearly any church in the U.S. <laughs> because basically religion teaches, oh no, every time you sin, you lose everything with God. And there's, ult the, there's extremes of this. Like for instance, the Pentecostals as a whole believe that every time you sin, that that sin causes you to go to hell. You are... You are not born again anymore. You're what the Bible or what the Pentecostals call backslid. You know, there's only a couple of times in the Bible that the term backslid is used and it's talking about a heifer. You're a backslidden heifer. And yet religion has made a whole new doctrine out of it, which what religion means by backslid means you were born again at one time, but you have sin in your life and unconfessed sin cannot go to heaven and so if you were to die with a unconfessed sin in your life, you're backslid and you would go to hell even though you've served the Lord for a hundred years. You would go to hell if you have an unconfessed sin in your life. Well, let me first of all say that sin is not only when you break a law, but it says in Romans, I believe it's 14, 23, it says to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So sin is not only when you break a direct command of God. Sin is when you fail to do what you should be doing. And you know what? Every one of us fail to do what we should be doing all of the time. We get caught up into self and there's people that walk right by us that are hurting and we aren't thinking about them. We're thinking about ourselves. That's sin. Scripture says that you're supposed to love your wife the way that Christ loves the church. You might be doing better than you've ever done. You might be doing better than most people, but nobody in here is loving their wife as much as they should. You're failing in that area. That's sin. 
The scripture says that you're supposed to reverence your husband the way that the church reverenced Christ. You might be doing better than you've ever done, but nobody in here does that perfectly. If, if unconfessed sin sends you to hell, we are all in big trouble. If I really believe that, the moment you got born again, I'd just kill you. I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven is just to get you saved and then kill you before you have time to mess the thing up, amen. <laughs> but see, that's not the way that it is. The moment you get born again, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And even though you gave Satan inroad into your body and because of it, you may suffer sickness, you might get put in jail, you might suffer condemnation and guilt and confusion and it'll make you spiritually dull and it'll hurt your mental, emotional part. All of those things might happen. That sin did not penetrate the spirit. It didn't penetrate that seal. And in your spirit, you are as righteous and holy and pure as the day you were created. God is a spirit and he looks at you in the spirit and God says, perfect. Even though you're out here living like an absolute jerk, God looks at you and he loves you and he's justified in loving you because your spirit has been sealed and it's perfected. And here is a... <laughs> I better turn over and read these verses. You wouldn't believe this is in the Bible if I don't read this to you. Look in Hebrews chapter 9. Wish I had time to put this whole thing in context. He's contrasting the Old Testament way of doing things with the New Testament way. And sad to say, most Christians today are still living as an old covenant person. In the old covenant, every time you sin, there had to be a new sacrifice made for sin. You know why? Because the Old Testament sacrifices could never take away sin. They were only symbolic. And it was to remind you that that sin, the punishment of that sin is death. And so somebody's got to die. And through the grace of God, he didn't make you die. He gave you an animal substitute. And you had to slit the throat and see an animal die every time you sin. And it was a constant reminder that you need uh, an atonement made for your sins. But they were only pictures and shadows, so it needed to be repeated over and over. But in the New Testament, Jesus only died for sins once, and you should not be sin conscious, and every time you sin, sitting there thinking that it is causing you to lose your relationship with God. That's the context of what he's talking about. So in Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 11, it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once. Five times in Hebrews chapter 9, it emphasizes once. If you aren't careful, you'll just skip over that and miss the significance. But if you were to take all of this in its context, he was talking about in the Old Testament, these sacrifices had to be made over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, all of the time. But the emphasis here is that Jesus entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption. Not redemption till the next time you sinned, and therefore you got to get it redeemed in your your sin under the blood again. Jesus purchased eternal redemption for you. Or another way of saying this is, he paid for all of your sins, past, present, and even the sins you haven't committed yet. Again, most Christians believe that they only got forgiven of sins up until the time that they got born again. And all of their past sins were wiped out. But now, every time you sin, you got to get that sin under the blood. And until you get it under the blood and confessed and repented of, God can't have any fellowship with you. He can't release his love into your life. You can't have any joy. You can't have any peace. God wouldn't use you with any sin in your life. Again, if that was true, none of us could ever be used because you might be doing better than you've ever done, but none of us are perfect in our attitudes and our actions and things like this. That's just impractical. And anybody who embraces that lives under a constant state of condemnation because your own conscience is constantly condemning you and showing you that you aren't worthy. And that's where most religious people live. They don't doubt God's ability. They just doubt God's willingness to use his ability on their behalf because their own heart condemns them and lets them know that they aren't worthy. But that's wrong. 
God didn't only forgive you of sins up until the time you got born again. He forgave you of all sin and obtained eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. You aren't just forgiven of past sins and then it's up to you to keep everything confessed. You are forgiven of past, present, and even the sins you haven't committed have already been forgiven. And somebody says, how can God forgive a sin before you commit it? You better hope he can forgive a sin before you commit it because he only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago. I don't know how he does this, but God is able to anticipate every sin. Through his foreknowledge, he knows everything that you and I will ever have done, and he's already dealt with it. You know, my sister has a daughter that is now nearly, she's getting close to 50 years old, but when she was little, and she still is a pain, <laughs> but when she was little, she was a major pain. She could have made a saint cuss. <laughs> she was the most rebellious kid I've ever seen in my life. And I mean, she just knew how to push your buttons and stuff. And so anyway, my sister was cooking supper for her husband who was coming home from the university uh, at um, uh, Shawnee, Oklahoma, OBU, Oklahoma Baptist University. And he was bringing another professor home. So Joyce was cooking the meal and getting all this done. And Lee came in and just got to aggravating her and pushing her buttons and doing all this stuff. And anyway, Joyce just lost her cool and hauled off and hit Lee and knocked her flat of her back in the kitchen. And my sister's spirit-filled Christian. She's seen people raised from the dead, had a person die in the back seat of her car and raised her from the dead. She knows better. And she just lost her temper and she knocked her daughter flat of her back. And when she did, she felt so condemned. She ran upstairs. She threw herself across the bed. And she had all of this food, cooking, and company coming home. And she says, Lord, you've got to help me. If I start crying, I won't come out of here until tomorrow morning. And she says, I've got to pull it together. How do I deal with this? And the Lord spoke to her and he said, Joyce, when you were eight years old and you got born again, I knew you were going to do this, and I've already forgiven it. This is not something new between you and me. I've already dealt with it and I still love you. And you know what? That didn't make her just say, oh, I'm forgiven. So go down and whoop up on your daughter again. <laughs> just slap your daughter because after all, I'm forgiven. No, it made her go down and, and tell Lee that I'm sorry that I did that. And she repented and it broke the dominion of that sin because God had already forgiven it. But you know, most people, every time you sin, it's like, oh God, how could I have done this against you? And how could you love me? Look, and you feel like you have to suffer for at least a certain period of time, a day or a week or something. You can't expect God to just treat you as if you've never sinned because after all, you don't deserve it. That is a person who's living in this carnal person, not understanding it in the spirit. You were, had received eternal redemption. That spirit was sanctified and holy and perfect. And then it was sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that sin didn't enter into your spirit. God is the spirit. He's looking at you in the spirit. And God's not upset with you, even though you are messing up big time. This causes fear in a lot of people because they think, Whoa. If I believe that, I'd just go live in sin. What's the difference? God's already loved me. Well, that's just stupid. Because you are giving Satan direct inroad into your body and into your mind. And you are, there are consequences to that sin. I guarantee you, Joyce hitting Lee like that did not help their relationship. And there were consequences because of it. You shouldn't be doing stuff like that. And if you do it, you need to repent and turn from it. But it didn't affect God. God is dealing with you based on who you are in the spirit and God still sees you righteous and holy and pure regardless of what you do. And if you could ever understand that, if you ever really got a revelation of this, you would become so thankful to God for the way he set things up. And you would just become so thankful that you would wind up giving your life to God you would serve him better accidentally than you ever have on purpose before if you understood how forgiven you are and how awesome he is. Love will cause you to live a holier life than fear and punishment ever caused you to fear, to live. And plus, you won't have any of the problems and any of the side effects that goes along with fear. 
we received eternal redemption. In verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Your spirit has already been purged. The moment you got born again, your spirit is perfect. Your relationship with God is perfect. The problem is your conscience. Every time you go out and sin, you violate your conscience. You have an internal knowledge of right and wrong, and every time you violate it, your conscience will go to condemning you. And you have to purge your conscience. It's not your spirit that needs to be purged. It's already purged and sealed. It's your conscience. And if I had time, I'm not going to be able to get to this, but in Hebrews chapter 10, it says that you have to enter into the holy of holies, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and your bodies washed with pure water by the word. Your spirit's already perfect, but you aren't only a spirit. You have a soul and a body. And if you go live in sin, your mind, your conscience is going to condemn you. According to 1 uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, it says that if you don't have a good conscience, it makes your faith shipwrecked. You will not be able to sit there and demand, say, in the name of Jesus, be healed, and your conscience the whole time saying, you hypocrite. Man, you're living in adultery and here you are acting like you're doing all of these things. You can't even get your own life together. How can you get anybody else's life together? You know what? You, you aren't going to be able to win that battle if you just do that. It's better to just not give your conscience an opportunity to condemn you and live as holy as you possibly can. But you won't be able to do it perfectly and you've got to understand the things we're talking about so that you're confidence and faith won't be in your performance, but it'll be in Jesus and not based on your goodness and your holiness. And then it says in verse uh, 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. In verse 12, it talks about eternal redemption. Verse 15, eternal inheritance. Did you know that the body of Christ as a whole only believes in momentary redemption and momentary inheritance? As long as I'm walking with God and keeping all of my sins confessed and living holy, then I'm right with God. But if I sin, the extreme says you lose your salvation every time you sin. And if you died before you got that sin confessed, you'd go to hell, even though you've been born again for 40 years. A lesser interpretation, but it's, it's like a stick. It's, it's just opposite ends, but it's the same stick. It's the same principle. There are people like the Baptists that I grew up with. They believe once saved, always saved. You don't lose your salvation. You just lose all of your joy and your peace and your fellowship. And God won't bless you and use you if you got any sin in your life. That's still the same thing, saying that that sin's not forgiven and that that sin, until repented of and confessed, will keep God from either allowing you into heaven or a lesser consequence is he, will, he won't fellowship with you. He won't bless you. He won't use you. You won't have joy. He won't answer your prayers, etc., and stuff like that. That's the exact same principle. It's just lesser consequences. Everybody understand that? And that is not true. You have eternal inheritance and eternal redemption. That means it's eternal. Amen. That means it doesn't fluctuate. How can that be? People stumble because they say, you're just saying that what this person does doesn't matter. No, it has consequences in the physical, natural realm, but your spirit is sealed with the Holy Spirit and that sin doesn't penetrate the seal. That impurity doesn't affect who you are in Christ. You remain the righteousness of God and you can come boldly before God even in, um, in the midst of sin and you could come boldly in if you were standing in the spirit instead of in your flesh. And if you're going to worship God, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Man, that's awesome. The criticism that people have against this, they say, well, you're just encouraging sin. You're giving people a license to sin. That's not what I'm saying. First of all, people do pretty good sinning without a license. <laughs> so it's not like, uh, you know, that they were already living a holy life. And I can tell you, it says over in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, that the grace of God that brings salvation 
has appeared unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. You know, I'm glad God called me to teach this because people can't use that logic against me and say, this grace just encourages people to live in sin. I'm living a holier life than probably most people in here. And I guarantee you, you can't look at me and say that understanding the grace of God causes you to live in sin. It has caused me to live a holy life. That's like saying that if you, if you tell your wife every day that you love her and tell her how awesome she is and don't ever criticize her and beat her down and make her fearful that you're going to hit her or slap her if she does something wrong. And instead, you bring her flowers and you bring her candy. If you treat them good, she's liable to commit adultery on you. It's exactly the opposite. Treating people good makes them love you and it makes them want to stay faithful to you. Instead of using fear and, you know, tying them to the bedpost and refusing to let them out or something like that, that's what the law does. You just love them so much that, man, they'll, they'll be faithful to you because of love. And yet the religious mindset is it causes fear to take, fear, to take punishment away and remove the, the punishment and the, and the fear that goes with it. People think, well, what's going to cause people to live holy if, you, if God's not going to get them? How about the fact that God loved them so much that he paid for all of their sins and he is such a good God. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Religion is afraid to let people go on love only. We feel like they need a good dose of condemnation. But man, we've received eternal in redemption, eternal inheritance. I wish they had time to read the whole thing. I'm not making very much progress. So let me just skip down to a few verses. Go down to... Um, this is chapter 9, and in verse 24, it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. In other words, he's not entered into a physical temple here on the earth, but it's talking about he went into heaven and appeared in the temple that's in heaven and put his blood on the mercy seat. So Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after that the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them which look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Can you understand the emphasis in this? The emphasis is that Jesus just appeared once. One time he dealt with your sins. Once for all. Once. Jesus doesn't reapply his blood. We got this religious terminology. You got to get the blood. You got to get that sin under the blood. You got to get it reapplied. That's when you get born again. When you get born again, he dealt with your sins, past, present, and future. He gave you a brand new spirit that has no sin, no impurities. It's identical to Jesus. He sealed it with the Holy Spirit. And if you sin, that sin can still corrupt your body and corrupt your mind and your emotions. So therefore, don't do it. But it does not stain taint, contaminate your spirit. Your spirit remains righteous and truly holy. It was dealt with once for all. God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make him love you more. You can't make him love you less. You can do things that'll make you love God more. You can do things that'll make you love God less, but God loves you and he just thinks you're awesome. He sees you in the spirit and he is justified of fellowshipping with you even though you aren't doing what you should because God's fellowshipping with you based on who you are in the spirit. He's fellowshipping with you spirit to spirit, not spirit to flesh. And so in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? There's a question mark there. If the Old Testament sacrifices actually did anything, they were only symbolic. 
They were only a picture of what Jesus was going to do. So therefore, it didn't really do anything. It was symbolism, and the symbolism had to be repeated over and over and over. If they really did anything, wouldn't they have quit offering them? That's the question, and the obvious answer is yes. Because here's why they would have quit offering them. Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. The Old Testament sacrifices were only symbols, so they had to be offered over and over. But the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus wasn't symbolic. It was actual. And when he offered himself, that should end it. And you know what the results should be? We should have no more conscience of sin. Again, this is off the charts for most people. Most people would feel sinful if they didn't feel sinful. If they didn't have a sin consciousness, they would think this is not right. It's our sin consciousness that makes us holy and pure. And when we come before, that's what humility is to many people. That's not true. Jesus has obliterated sin. Sin is not the issue between you and God. Amen. I know some of you, your head's going tilt. If somebody would have said this to me 20 or 30 years ago, it probably would have just blown all my circuit breakers <laughs> like I can't handle that. But this is saying that if the Old Testament sacrifices could have worked, they would have had no more conscience of sin. Our New Testament sacrifice did work. Therefore, we should have no more conscience of sin. You ought to worship God in spirit and in truth, not in flesh. People who are sin conscious are people who are living out of their flesh, their carnal, natural self. If you were living out of your spirit, you would feel no condemnation of sin, no sin consciousness. Man, those are awesome statements. But that's out of the Bible. How can this be? Well, I wish I had time to read all of these verses, but I'm hurrying. Uh, go down to uh, verse 10, Hebrews 10:10. 10, 10. By the which will, he talked about that Jesus died, and when he died, his will was put into effect. Here's the benefits. Here's our inheritance of what Jesus' death accomplished. By the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that is powerful. That is awesome. You are sanctified. The word sanctified means to make holy or set apart. Remember Ephesians 4, 24 says that put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The moment you got born again, you became a new creature and you were sanctified, made holy once for all. Once. You don't become holy and then unholy and then holy again as you repent and then unholy and then holy again and unholy. You aren't born again, 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 again. You just get born again one time and you don't ever get unborn again. You don't ever lose your right standing. You don't ever lose God's love and fellowship. You were sanctified, made holy once for all. I've had some people challenge me on this and says that means once for all people, not for all time. Well, I'm glad you said that because look at the context right here. It goes back to the Old Testament, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, offering, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. An Old Testament animal blood of goats and bulls couldn't take away sins. Verse 12, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. It's not talking about one sacrifice for all people. That is true. But this is talking about one sacrifice forever, for all times. Jesus does not reapply the blood to you when you mess up. He's already forgiven all of your sins and your spirit has been sanctified and perfected forever. Keep reading. After this, he sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 10 says you were sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once 
for all, and verse 14 says, if you were sanctified, you have been made perfect. You're perfect. You can't get better than perfect. Your spirit's perfect. It's identical to Jesus. See, people read this and they just think, oh, this is so hard to understand. It's only hard to understand if you're carnally minded and if you're trying to see this in your physical body. You're thinking, this is perfect. You go look in the mirror and you got gray hair and zits and ugly. <laughs> and you think, this is perfect. No, it's not talking about your physical body. And then you search your emotions and your mental part and you think, this is perfect. I didn't even pass my last test. I put my glasses somewhere, couldn't find them, and they were on top of my head. <laughs> Man, this is perfect. This is as good as it gets. No, it's not talking about your brain. But in your spirit, you are sanctified and perfected forever. Look in chapter 12, and it'll say this. Remember that the book of Hebrews wasn't written in chapter and verses. We added that for reference. But it was one letter. This is the same Arthur, author speaking, and he is making the same statements just a few uh, sentences later in chapter 12. And in verse 22, it says, But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Right here in context, it tells you what part of you was made perfect, sanctified and perfected forever. Your spirit, your spirit is perfect forever. It's your spirit that's been sanctified and made perfect. You're already perfect. People are saying, oh God, just touch me and do something. You're already touched. Your spirit's got everything. Oh God, heal me in your spirit. There's already healing, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Oh God, give me knowledge. It says you know all things in your spirit. You have the mind of Christ. Oh God, give me faith. You've already got the faith of God. Oh God, give me anointing. He that hath anointed us is God, who hath already blessed us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Everything you're wanting and needing is already in there. Some of you are too young to remember this old commercial they had about Pray goo spaghetti sauce. Somebody says, oh, I want basil. And they said, it's in there. Well, I want oregano. It's in there. Well, I want this. It's in there. I want that. It's in there. And that, anyway, that was, they claim to have everything in that spaghetti sauce. Well, your spirit's like that. Whatever you need, it's in there. Amen. It's already in there. You've already got it. God's already done everything. You don't need God to give you anything. You need to renew your mind to what you already have and start releasing it. You aren't only a spirit. You've got a physical body and a mind and emotions. And so you don't want it to just stay in here. You could, you could be depressed. People have been depressed and committed suicide having the life of God on the inside of them. People die of cancer with the power that raised Jesus from the dead inches away from the very thing that's killing them. And yet they don't know how to access it because you have to, first of all, you can't release something that you don't believe you have. And the body of Christ hasn't been told who they are and what they have in Christ. They're told that God can do anything, but it's all out there. And there are demons blocking our prayers from getting through to heaven. That's just crazy. You don't need your prayers to get up there. You don't need them to get above the ceiling or above your nose. God's here on the inside of you, amen. That's why you bow your head when you pray so that you can say, Father, amen. <laughs> God's right here. <laughs> so much of our doctrines and all of this stuff is wrong because people don't know that we've already got it in Christ. We don't know who we are. Once you start understanding this, You'll walk by people who are dying and you'll say, man, I've got the same power that raised Christ from the dead living on the inside of me. And you'll start thinking, how can I get that out of me and into them? Amen. It'll change the way you look at things. You'll sit there and hear people talking about recession and instead of you just thinking, well, I'm only human, I'm just a man. You'll think, man, I got the same power on the inside of me that Jesus had. And he had Peter go get a... Uh, a coin out of a fish's mouth. If I have to, God will tell me that. And you'll go to thinking differently. You'll see different possibilities. You won't see yourself as only human. 
I'm not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. One third of me is identical to Jesus. Therefore, if I can renew my mind to it, I can see the exact same things happen in my life that have happened in the life of Jesus because it's Him living on the inside of me. And the only thing that limits Him is my small thinking. If I can renew my mind and find out who I am in Christ and begin to act and talk like it, well, then Jesus can live through me and He can do the same things through me that He did in His physical body when He was here on this earth. I don't need another anointing. I don't need a double dip. I don't need a double anointing. I don't need anything except a renewing of my mind to what God has already given me. Man, I don't know if that helps you or not, but that just has transformed my life. Let me look and see whether I can cover this in this lesson or if I have to wait until the next lesson. Let me look. That's the next lesson. So that'll be next hour. But let me go ahead and say this. If people say, well, if all of this be true, well, then um, why live holy? You know, this is what the book of Romans was written about, specifically Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. You know, this word, God forbid, is the closest thing to profanity that you can get without using profanity. I mean, it is an absolute, unqualified negative. Absolutely not. That is not what Paul was saying. But did you know Paul said that four times? He said it twice in, in Romans chapter 6. He also said it in Galatians. Every time he taught on grace and who we are in Christ... This question came up. Am I just saying that you can live in sin because you have grace? And he had to say, God forbid, every time. But here's a great point. You need to get this. If the person you're listening to preach the Word of God never brings this question up, can I just live in sin because all of my sins have been forgiven? If that question never comes up, you haven't heard the same gospel that Paul preached. Because Paul had that question come up every time he taught on this. And most people, where they go to church and where they hear people preach, they never have that question come up. Because, man, it's all sin consciousness. And it's all about you've got to get rid of this sin before God will do this and this and this. That's not the true gospel. The true gospel, if it's preached properly, will always cause people to think, are you just saying that I can live in sin? And of course, the answer to that is God forbid. No, that's not what I'm saying, but it is a logical question. If I'm already forgiven and if I'm sealed and if nothing penetrates that seal, well, then why go live holy? Paul gives two reasons here in Romans chapter 6. The first one is, he says, know ye not, that as many as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death. Don't you understand that you're dead to sin? You're born again spirit. Your nature has been changed. And if you weren't polluted by religion and tradition and doctrines of men, it is the nature of a Christian to live holy. The same as it's the nature of an unborn again person, a non-believer, to live unholy. The reason you lived in sin is because that was your nature. Your nature has been changed now. And if you didn't have religion, which I could spend days or weeks on this, religion actually makes sin come alive. That's what the Bible says. The law makes sin come alive. The law will drive you to sin. The Old Testament law wasn't to set you free from sin, but instead to ensnare you in sin and to make sin bog you down and overcome you. It was the strength of sin, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, and on and on I could go. The Old Testament law wasn't to set you free from sin, but it gave sin dominion over you. Romans chapter 6, verse 14, I believe it is, says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You can turn this around and say, If you are under grace, but if you're under the law, sin will have dominion over you. So the law actually makes us sin. If you want to, uh, 
If you want to have people start committing adultery, go to preaching against adultery and preaching the law that God is angry with you, God's going to judge you, and you go to preaching against adultery, and I guarantee you adultery will take place. Some people think, no, it's just the opposite. No, I can guarantee you that is the way it is. You preach the law. You know, if some of you didn't even like chocolate, I don't know how you exist if you don't like chocolate. I've heard that nine out of ten people like chocolate, and the tenth person always lies. Amen. But even if you didn't like chocolate, if I said, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not have chocolate, and if I started preaching against it, and God hates you if you eat chocolate, and God will never bless you again, and if I started preaching against chocolate, some of you who don't even like chocolate would go to lusting for it. <laughs> it's true. That's just the way that God made us. There's something inside of us that does not like to be told, you can't do it. When you were a kid, you used this logic all of the time. You had somebody and you wanted them to do something. I remember one time wanting a kid to walk across this log, across a, a pond, because I knew he was going to fall in. And so I tried to get him to do it. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. And I said, you can't do it. You're a sissy. And you know what? You'd go to insulting people, and guess what? He walked across the log and fell in. That's the law. That's what the law is. There's something on the inside of you that when somebody says you can't, something says, bless God, I will. That's just your human fallen nature. You know, I was running a race one time as a 6K race, and I was, I was, uh, I'd already turned in my personal record. I was going to beat my time. It was good, but I had totally worn myself out. And some of you don't know, but I'm a super competitor. When my kids were one year old, I played tiddlywinks with them and I beat the socks off of them. <laughs> I told my kids, if you ever beat me, you beat me. I've never thrown a game of nothing in my life, amen. My dad taught me that second place is first loser. <laughs> I'm not a bad loser, but I just never have lost intentionally in my life. I am competitive. So anyway, here I was running this race and a guy started passing me in the last quarter of a mile. And he could tell that when he started coming, even though I was worn out, I tried to keep up with him. I was giving it everything I had, and he was still pulling away from me. And he got a few steps in front of me, and he looked over his shoulder, and he says, you could do better than that. And man, I mean, it's like the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> My uh, adrenaline kicked in, and I mean, I just... Boom, went right past that guy. I crossed the finish line. Jamie was there, and I collapsed. She had to drag me out of the way. I don't know where that came from, but when somebody says, thou shalt not do something, something on the inside just says, bless God, I will. And that's what the law was for. But see, now your nature is changed. And if you weren't preached the law that activates sin and empowers sin, and if you were told about who you are in Christ, you know what? It is your nature to live holy. You would just live holy naturally is the first thing that he says there in Romans chapter 6. And then in verse 16, he gives a second reason for living holy. He says in verse 16, uh, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The first reason I live holy is because my nature's been changed. I want to live holy. The love of Christ constrains me to be holy. The second reason I live holy is because I know that Satan is going to eat my lunch and pop the bag if I give him an opportunity. So I don't yield to the devil. I resist because I don't want Satan to have an inroad into my life. I could even add a third reason to that, and that is that, you know what, my testimony to other people is useless if I'm out living in sin and yet telling them about how God can free you up. So those are three reasons that I live holy, but none of them have to do anything with God loving me. God loves me based on who I am in the Spirit, and that doesn't change even when I mess up. Man, that's good news. I'll tell you, what I've shared in last hour and this hour is completely different than 90-something percent of all Christianity is preaching today. And if you understood and embraced this, you know what? It would change. Everything else, all of these other erroneous doctrines would fall if you got a full revelation of who you are in Christ. In fact, it's already done. You aren't trying to earn God's favor. You aren't trying to get the anointing. You aren't trying to clean yourself up. 
if you were coming from a victory instead of trying to go to a victory, it would totally change your life. This is life-changing. These are the things that totally changed my life. 